I found out about my heart condition when I was 17. And, you know, mm-hmm. most 17 year olds don't have to deal with their own mortality. Like when something is wrong, you keep it to yourself because you're afraid of how people are going to view you. You know, we keep saying our parents and that, but we can't keep blaming our parents for everything. At some point we got to smarten up, but that's the way it was. You were the strong, silent type and I was for years. And then I realized that, you know, it's not doing me any good. And there's some things that are just bigger than me that I can't, you know, figure out on my own. Welcome to the Green Table Talk. I'm your host, Janine Johnson. Today, we are joined by my friends, Charles, Ulysses, and Fadia. And we'll be diving into mental health and our community, the Black community. Everyone, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining me today. Hello. Hi. Hi. (laughs) Hey, Janine. Good to see you. Good to see everybody. Yes. 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 Hello. I'm glad you guys took the time to join me today for this very important topic. Um, as you know, I've been wanting to do this episode for some time, but it's there's so much behind this topic of mental health and our community, mental health and, and Black men in general, just that just the whole thing. There's just so much. And I didn't know where to start. So I reached out to you guys and you very generously shared videos, gave me ideas and just gave me a, a way to navigate this topic because I just felt like there's so much is kind of overwhelming in a sense because just looking at people's stories and what they go through and so thank you very much for helping me with this because it was a lot it was a lot I found out a lot of information I actually made notes because I didn't want to miss anything Um, so while I was doing my research I came across an article by a young lady her name is Mame Kalembe she is a mental health uh, content specialist and a registered psychotherapist she did an article And I'm just going to read a portion of this article for you, and I just want to get your feedback on it. The mental health of Black individuals is often shaped by microaggression, racism, discrimination, and inequity. The stress of these experiences may increase a person's risk of mental illness and impact psychological well-being. Now, this part really blew my mind. There's a high degree of stigma associated with mental health or illness in the Black communities. According to a study conducted by Ottawa Public Health, 66% of participants believe that most people would think less of someone who's affected by mental illness. Similarly, 40% believe that seeking treatment for a mental health issue is a sign of personal failure. There's a lot of shame associated with poor mental health. And many people believe that it's a sign of weakness. This widely held belief has an impact on the Black community in a whole, in a whole, and preventing individuals from addressing their difficulties. What do you think of those numbers? Sixty-six percent of participants believe that they they'll look at someone less than if they knew that they had mental illness. I think that's that's an astonishing amount. That's a huge number. So let's start with that. Why do you feel our society, or according to the survey, why do you feel that 66% of people who took the survey, and this is just the survey, so we know it's far greater than just the survey, right? Why do you think they're looked upon as less than if they have mental health issues and they, they need help? Um, well, I would start by saying that historically, um, you know, due to slavery and a lot of stigma connected to to that, black people have always been viewed as um, we can take pain more than anybody else in the world, mm-hmm. which is not true, but that's the narrative that's been going on since slavery to probably now. Uh, mm-hmm. I would say now because I remember there was a documentary that came out on um, uh, Serena Williams while she was pregnant and um, she was saying like she wasn't feeling well and she went in and they were, she was explaining to them that she was feeling pain, but she doesn't look like the typical way that, you know, the, I say Caucasian look at pain and they dismiss her. We're talking about Serena Williams that has money, mm-hmm. goes to a mm-hmm. hospital and they dismiss her pain. So let's not talk about Joe down the street going to the hospital, right. the same thing. So it's like, you be, you're going to be treated even worse. So this is physical. 
So on the mental side of it is the fact that we're as a as a people we were always um, we were always I guess proud to 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 showcase our strength and I think showing like you know whether whether it's pain whether showing any sign of weakness it's viewed as something that is um, looked down down upon to so yeah. I think that's where it starts. Uh, I'll okay. leave it for anybody else to chime in, but that, I think that's where it starts. I was thinking of the statistics, right? Um, I like to look at the numbers and what does the number represent? So we may hear 60% and someone may be like, you know, how many people did they question? Uh, where did they question them and so on? But 66%, you know, it's not 22. It's not... Yes. It, 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 it's 66. So even if you were to take 10 people and you interviewed 10 people, six out of them would express the same thing. Right. So it does. It's almost like it doesn't really matter the the pool of people or how many people they've, they've interviewed, they've questioned. It's still a huge amount uh, uh, of people represented that feels this the same way. So I think it's enough to say that there's something that's almost beyond, not almost, it is beyond the persons, right? I, I want to say that it's systematic, just like our, my friend um, Yuli said, right? It's, 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 it comes from something that's outside of our community and has been perpetuated over time to the point where it becomes part of, of the, the, I wouldn't, I don't want to say identity because I don't want to claim that as part of our identity, but it's been placed on us. Mm -hmm. Right. And the world kind of sees us in this way um, that we have, we constantly have to um, prove, disprove. We constantly have to fight against. We, we constantly have to actually name the thing by its name and say, it's actual discrimination. It's actual uh, yeah. uh, uh, systematic that you think I am this way, right? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, you know, like I we've we've heard it at home, right? Yes. Why are you lazy? And it's like, well, it's not laziness. It's that I'm actually struggling right now, yes. and my zoning out or am I just sleeping the entire day and night and the next day and the next night is an indication that something is off but mm -hmm. what I see at home is that uh I, well I'm not taking care of my responsibilities I'm not doing my chores I'm not right from a young person to adulthood is the same is the same narrative right you're lazy you're lazy you're lazy well those words are definitely attached to something very specific and mm -hmm. we have to name, we have to name it we have to name it mm -hmm. charles what do you think elise and fadia couldn't have set me up more perfectly because mm -hmm. I, it went right home to me you know i'm thinking of my dad a lot lately because he was the first one to talk teach me about mental toughness and mm -hmm. uh I was born and raised down in the deep South in the great state of Georgia, um, where when we went to school, we saw the things about the civil rights movement, the movies and stuff in school. I didn't have to see those movies. He lived through it. My mom lived through it. So they told me about it. And, you know, there's a perception, you know, that we are less than, you know, the whole of the United States was built on white supremacy. And my dad told me to fight against that. You know, you basically got to be twice as good to have half a chance. And, um, the shirt that I'm wearing underneath my jacket, you know, across my chest is keep banging, which is my motto. And then on the back is a paraphrase of a conversation that I had with him when I was a teenager. And it says that I do, do not live down to other people's expectations. Instead, I've chosen to live up to my own because I can't let anybody else tell me what I'm supposed to be or what I'm not supposed to be. It's up to me. And that's a mental struggle in itself. I carry that with me every day. And mm -hmm. I wear this T-shirt, you know, especially for this episode to remind myself of that. And it's not just me. It's everybody who looks like me, you know, so I know yeah. you guys have been through it, too. So. Like you list said, we're supposed to be these strong physical beings. And then Fadia saying, if you're not living up to, you know, your parents expectations at home, then that's a weakness. And mm -hmm. I remember the first time I ever went to counseling and. I thought, you know, if my dad could see me now, he'd say, you know, you're weak. There's something wrong with you. And and that's not right. You know, yeah. you, you got to get past that. 
And that's kind of where I'm coming at it from. Mm -hmm. But I would add to it too, where in terms of historically, like, you know, generation to generation, you know, let's say our great grandparents went to slavery and then mm -hmm. our parents went from slavery to Jim Crow, Jim Crow to civil rights, civil rights to where we are today, right? Mm -hmm. And when they look at us, they say like, what are you guys complaining about? Exactly. You know what we went through? <laughs> you don't know like, what we hard went, is. Exactly. We went through worse yeah. than what you're going through right now. And yep. what are you guys complaining? You guys have nothing to complain about. Mm -hmm. So this has been like the mindset that that keep us like, you know, like when something is wrong, you keep it to yourself because you're afraid of how people are going to view you based on the fact that, well, you should not be complaining about that. I'm going to give an example. Let's say uh, my parents would say like, you know, back in the day, we didn't have a car. We used to walk like, you know, miles and miles and miles to do whatever. Now you're taking the bus and you're complaining. Now I'm not taking the bus. I'm driving and I'm looking at my 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 nephew, my, you know, my, my stepdaughter. Now they're taking Uber. They're not taking the bus. They're taking Uber. So it's like... <laughs> what what we think about like the way we were raised, we like you know. So it's like if the way I was raised, I'm considered to be soft compared to my parents. Yeah. The generation after me, I'm I'm come I'm viewing them as even softer than I was. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's it's that's where I think a lot of it starts. And how do we change that? It's to, you know, to put I guess, verbiage to how we feel. And because before, like, you know, as Fadia was explaining, like, if I don't feel good, like, you know, I, I, I will sleep the day in. and like something is off, but the signal is out, you know, I'm, I'm manifesting it, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not able to verbalize it. So a lot of the times, like, you know, from our generation, we weren't able to verbalize those things. And that's why we were labeled as lazy or whatever. Right. So mm -hmm. now because it's becoming mainstream and we're talking about it a bit more, we're able to put words to those things, to those feelings, to those emotions, etc. So now we have a better understanding of those things. But we if we understand where it's come from, now we can maybe, you know, help improve how we can, you know, address it, you know, for the, the generation, you know, mm -hmm. that's coming after us. You've actually hit the nail on the head for me, Elise, because um, when I was growing up, so my grandmother had like 13 kids, right? They're from Trinidad and Tobago, had 13 kids. And so when I was growing up, my mom would say to me, you know, when, when we were growing up, we have to wash our clothes by hand on our washing board. We had to hang the clothes up, the dishes. We had to just go in the back and wash it, the water from the bucket and wash it, like all this stuff. And then she said, and you're complaining. You have the sink you have. You know, we didn't have a dishwasher. We weren't privileged to have a dishwasher, right? When I was growing up. Now you have the sink, you have soap and water and a sponge. And then now my daughter, who's now 18, she's got a dishwasher. So now my husband will say to her, you know, you're doing the dishes. All you got to do is just put it in the dishwasher. When I was growing up, you know, we're not that old. So I'd like to think, <laughs> me and my husband, right? When I was growing up, he used to say to her, I had two jobs. I had to walk to school. <laughs> I had to do the dishes by hand and all you've got to do is just like do the dishes, put it in the dishwasher. You get a ride to school and you're saying you're tired from your long day. Tired from what? And uh, so when you said that, it just reminded me of like, yeah, I, I heard that. And then, yeah, we kind of do that to our daughter too. You know, like, what do you think you're tired? I had that conversation with her today. She went to school. She's in college now. She went to school. I picked her up. And she's like, oh, I'm so tired. And I'm like, you were at school for three hours. And what do you mean? Three hours, you had a break, like however long, half hour break, whatever. What are you tired from? You know, so you just hit the nail right on the head when you mentioned that to me. It just it made me chuckle when you were telling that story. Yeah. So um, Charles, you touched upon something in terms of your father. Uh, and if he knew that you went into therapy, you know, he'd think that that you're, you said, I think it was weak or less than I believe you said. I can't yeah, remember. He, he would think it was a weakness. Yeah. Weakness, exactly. So I was reading once again this article um, from Mame. Uh, she said, in regards to the bias of the healthcare system, historically, Black people have been negatively impacted by prejudice and discrimination in the healthcare system. 
Even to this day, individuals sometimes deal with uh, provider bias, both conscious and unconscious, which can, re- which can result in misdiagnosis, inadequate treatment, and this will also lead to mistrust in reaching out to mental health professionals. So do you feel that one of the reasons why we don't, well, not, not only we as in the, the ACB community, but men more specifically, don't reach out to healthcare providers because they figured out it's just a waste of time or they feel, oh, they can't help me. They're not black. Most of the healthcare providers aren't black. They don't know how to deal with my situation. And so they just suffer in silence and just, you know, whatever happens, happens. Do you feel that's what the article said is true? That, you know, we're just destined to suffer in silence basically because we don't have adequate healthcare, especially for the men. Because like you said, Charles, men are supposed to be tough. And I believe Yuli said it as well. Men are supposed to be tough. You're not supposed to, you know, show emotions, you know, you know, toughen it up. So do you feel that we're just destined to just suffer in silence? Yeah, I think we're setting ourselves up for failure because mm-hmm. that whole generation, I mean, you know, we keep saying our parents and that, but we can't keep blaming our parents for everything. At some point sure. we got to smarten up, but that's the way it yeah. was. You were the strong silent type and I was for years. And then mm-hmm. I realized that, you know, it's not doing me any good. And there's some things that are just bigger than me that I can't, you know, figure out on my own. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the serious part. But before I go on with that, I have to go back to this whole dishwashing thing um, because I have a dishwashing <laughs> story too. My dad was a tough guy. My mom, you know, was a unconditional love and that, but I remember one time we had a house and there was a dishwasher in it. And uh, I was like, Mama, why don't we ever use a dishwasher? You know, because we didn't. And she said, I got two of them. And she pointed at me and my little brother and started laughing. I was like, Mama, that wasn't what I was asking. But you know, I'll never forget that. So, so yes. But um, <laughs> why waste electricity? Exactly. <laughs> when and I got you like, two able bodied young men, you know, to wash dishes, yeah, you need to learn you've something. got two hands. Your brother That's has right. two hands. <laughs> what, what do we need? Yes. So, uh, but now that's kind of my therapy, you know, is, uh, I enjoy washing dishes because it's something I can zone in on and, you know, just kind of forget about the rest of the world. There's a beginning and an end. I can see immediate, Mm -hmm. you know, progress from dirty dishes to clean dishes Mm -hmm. and it makes me feel good. And I actually wrote about it uh, once called the Zen of doing dishes. And Mm. uh, yeah. My husband feels the same way about vacuuming, actually. That's his, that's his Zen place. Uh You know what I mean? So I agree with that. And now you got a man who missed that. He likes washing dishes and your husband, a man who vacuums and he's good with that. You know, our and parents have never said that at all. Right? You know, so we have made a little progress. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I think you're asking, um, uh, Jenna, it's re- regarding like when you go to therapy. Um, well, th- there is this like, you know, this aspect, like, you know, when we speak to people that don't look like us, the first thing we think about is that they're going to be judging us. Yes. So we talk yes. about mental health. That's a, the number one part. Uh, even on the physical aspect of it, like, you know, we don't think that they understand us. Mm-hmm. We don't think that they view us on the same level. And we don't think that they even respect us. Like sometimes, like, you know, doctor will speak to you. You understand what they're saying. And they, they talk to you like as if like, like they have to dumb it down. Yes. But it, it's, it's, I don't know. It's um, the the word escaped me, but it's the way that they kind of um, speak in a way where uh, condescending, mm. mm-hmm. and and it's like we're talking about my health here, and yes. I'm the 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 driver of this, and you're talking to me as if like I'm like I have no choice in the matter. Like you mm-hmm. make the decision for me. You're telling me what I'm supposed to do. And I'm supposed to just listen to you and follow whatever it is that you say without having to question it. Mm-hmm. Historically, that's the way it was. Like, you know, the doctor used to be the kind of like, you know, after God is the doctor kind of thing. But mm-hmm. that mindset is started to change, like, you know, slowly. But you still have doctors that have the, you know, they call it the God complex. Um, so it's this similar for like, you know, for um, you know, psychologists and um therapists etc so it's like when we meet people that kind of look like us and same you know similar background there's this i cannot even put it to words but there's there's something inside of us that that makes us like you know you 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 open up a little bit more 
because mm -hmm. in, in I think psychology, like you know, you think that the person will um will treat you, you know, the same way that would like they would like to be treated. So like mm -hmm. there's the there's a some kind of affinity there where the um you, you can be at peace in, in a certain sense. Yes. You, you're more you, relaxed. You're more yeah. relaxed and you feel like you're on the same level because he or she understands okay. you. Right. And when you speak your story, like like you know, I, I just gave a story and you guys can all relate to it because yes. you want something similar. Although we are from different backgrounds, but we all have something similar that we can all relate. So yes. that's one of the things that we miss when we go to like you know the healthcare professionals and they don't look like us. That's the part where we miss. We mm -hmm. miss a lot of those like you know connections where you know sometimes they speak to us like as if we're not even even human beings. Yeah. It, yeah. It's hard to say like that, but that's the truth. So that's the part where it's like, why do you want, why would you go seek help if the help that you're seeking is mm -hmm. not giving you what you need or is not respecting you? X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Like if, at one point you have to go above those things, but mm -hmm. those are all the, 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 the foundation of why, like, you know, we say and we suffer in silence. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of, a lot of those issues that, that arise. To follow on what you just said, um, I saw this quote. It says, "Your mental health is everything. Prioritize it. Make the time like you like. Make the time like your life depends on it because it does." So my question is, do you feel that like right now? By the way, there's a massive wait list for people who want to see black doctors, black, black psychologists, you know, black counselor. Massive list. So if you're going through something, or someone that you know is going through a mental health crisis. Would you encourage them to stay on this long waiting list to see someone that looks like us? Or like that quote said, you know, treat your health like your life depends on it because it does. Would you encourage them? You know what? Take the first person you got. Yes, it might not be someone that looks like us, but you need help. So please take the first person that comes up. Is that the correct advice to give? Or would you tell them to keep waiting even though they are going through like a mental health crisis? Well, I would I'll always encourage depends. someone. <laughs> I would always encourage someone to talk to somebody. You know, um, mm -hmm. I don't care who they look like, because if mm -hmm. you keep it bottled up inside, then it's not going to do you any good. So, um, I think I won't take your words out of your mouth, Ulysses. But I think I was going to say try to do both. You know, talk to someone who's available, and then try to wait. If that person doesn't work out or isn't meeting your needs, then look for someone who is. But mm -hmm. definitely take that first step and. I'm thankful for this group. I'm thankful for this conversation. You know, um, yes. our ACB family, um, you guys mean a lot to me and I've been able to just be myself and open up, you know, and it's been years that I've been able to talk to someone who looks like me because before I kind of, you always think you're the only one and nobody understands because there's nobody that looks like you. And I've been through that system, you know, my whole life until, you know, a mm -hmm. couple years ago when I found you guys. So, uh, so this is a, a big blessing for me. I was we love having you around too, Charles. Yes. Was I you oh, thanks. <laughs> I plan on being here for a while. <laughs> Excellent. I was going to say, um, th there's things about me that if I have to do this thing, I'm just going to, I'm going to shut down. So for example, having to, so if I say I'm not feeling well, I need help. And then whoever I'm sharing that with will question will question me or not question me to, to find out more so they can give me the help, but more mm -hmm. in a, a judgmental way, I shut down, right? If I have of to keep myself over and over and over again, yes. I, I shut down. So this, this past year, actually, I, I was going through a really difficult time and it was my friend who said, Hey, Fadia, I know someone and mm -hmm. she is, I'm, I'm of Haitian background. Um, she's like, she's, she's uh, French speaking. She's Haitian. Uh, she speaks English. She lives here in Ontario. Um, you need to talk to her. You need to talk to her. You need to talk to her. So having, I would say to your last question and essentially what uh, uh, our, my brothers have echoed here, um, if you need help and you're in crisis mode, talk to the first person that's available. Really, mm -hmm. um, you need the help, so talk to them. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you can have a friend that can help you search for that black therapist, for that mm -hmm. uh, faith-based therapist, or what have ha what have you, um, also do that at the same time. But 
having a black therapist is a game <laughs> changer. Yes. So uh, this, this lady that I speak uh, with now, there's things about my culture that I don't have to explain because she knows, she right? Uh, there are things, um, uh, just like you, Lise, right? Right. There a couple of minutes ago. I don't know if it's the French or the Creole. I don't know what it was that kind of made you lose your your um your train of thought or your word that you were the word that you were looking for. But sometimes language can be a challenge. And mm -hmm. so in my sessions, I go back and forth, French, English, Creole, whatever comes out, I don't have to filter myself. There's this huge mm -hmm. level of who I am, I don't have to explain. Right. Yes. I don't want to talk about the dynamics of my family and how, you know, my father is the head of the household and my mom is this unconditional love, the person who does everything. She's essentially the neck, uh, you know, mm -hmm. of, of the house. Right. And there's things I don't have to explain yes. because she, she already understands. Gets so it. that I would say that that piece, having someone that understands um culture, religion um language those are the three things that i would say are are worth probably just as much as the therapy itself mm -hmm. right Having those connections is huge so now imagine if we had those nurses and we mm -hmm. have the nurses we're pretty well represented but if we had those uh specialists and uh and th those doctors those nephrologists those surgeons that were out there that we had um, access to, I think it mm -hmm. would, it would just make our, um, our teams, our health teams, the people that take care of us when we're in need uh, of better health, just much better. The experience would just be mm -hmm. completely different. Now, I know there are non-Black people, non-Caribbean people, non-African people out there that do an amazing job, yes. right? They are, they have the skills to be culturally sensitive they have the skills and the know-how to go outside of themselves and do the work um but because it's a lifelong journey you know they're on this journey as well and maybe they'll get it maybe they won't you're never sure you're never sure yes. but i i think i i i can't you know say it enough having a a black therapist that is of you know, understands culture and all these things is mm -hmm. worth a million bucks. 100%, 100%. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that, well, first of all, sorry, were you going to say something, Elise? Um, well, I just no. wanted to add to say like, you know, uh, seeking help is the most important thing. Talking mm -hmm. to somebody, better you talk to somebody than nobody at all. So that's what exactly. I would like to add to what you guys are saying. Exactly. Some help is better than no help, 100%. Um, so we've all been through um, health issues, you know, transplants, what have you. Do you feel that um, the mental health aspect is different for us who've been through mental health or who's been through transplants and, and health situations versus someone who's hasn't had any transplants, who's, you know, body's healthy, perfectly healthy, but they're just having a mental health issue? Because I know myself personally, I had a whole bunch of stuff going on in my head after surgery. You know, I, I'm like, you know, everyone's asking me how you're doing and blah, blah, blah. And so I knew I was going through a host of stuff. Right. So how, do you think that it, there's a difference in the two? Like, do we experience it more since we've been through such, you know, serious um, situations with our health? I, I'll say it's different. The difference is because we all, experience something is like life and death experience yes. it makes us look at life in a different way where mm -hmm. something that for most will be trivial for us will look at it in a different perspective or a different lens um mm -hmm. as an example i was going to something and and I, I i i spoke to charles and while i was talking to charles like he understood where i was coming from because he went through something similar himself mm -hmm. So by by him, like basically reassuring me that you know tomorrow is another day, and you know mm -hmm. you know God grace, like you know if I'm if I live to see tomorrow, it's gonna mm -hmm. get better and and, and better and better. So it's like he it was able to make me see the light at the end of the tunnel in a way where most people would not be able to bring it down 
to that level because it's they never there. experienced that. So it's yeah. for them, it's 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 kind of hard to seize that. It's kind of hard to even verbalize it. So mm -hmm. yeah, I would say it is different. Okay, Charles. Oh, I'm glad we had that conversation. I'm glad that it it made uh you know some sense and helped out because that's what I'm all about. And I had uh two things. Uh, first of all, to answer your question, Janine was uh, and I agree with you. List two hundred percent is that we see it different because you know it's not just uh kind of like mental health or a mental health challenge that we're dealing with. We're dealing with the life and death challenge, and that's the thing that we have to deal with that most other people don't is that mm -hmm. our decisions, you know, affect our life. Like if we have life or not, you know, I found out about my heart condition when I was 17 and, you know, mm -hmm. most 17 year olds don't have to deal with their own mortality. And that's why people don't talk about transplant or, you know, all that stuff because nobody wants to think about one day I'm going to die. You know, none yeah. of us get out of this thing alive. Um, but we have to deal with it day to day. We have to make choices, you know, about that. And the hardest thing for me to do, was the first thing was just to figure out, is it worth it? You know, is it mm -hmm. worth it me going through all this stuff to get a transplant, you know, to sign up for that lifelong contract to taking medication for the rest of my life to make sure my transplant doesn't fail. You know, I'm going to be seeing doctors for the rest of my life, all this kind of stuff. And, you know, when I was 17 and they first said, you have this heart condition that can kill you. I did like what most 17 year olds I think would do in my position. I just went to denial. They got the wrong guy. I ain't going to die yeah. because I'd done all this stuff up until that point, you know, that said that I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. And I'd had no evidence to the contrary up until that point. And then I was still in denial. And <laughs> one day God said, hey, wake up. You know, yeah. there's a massive stroke while you're driving down the highway. 19 years later, there is something wrong with you and you better fix it. And mm -hmm. so uh, I agree that it is hard and it's different. It's different for us. Um, the other thing I thought of was that is kind of the common ground because disease and health issues, they do not discriminate. They don't care if you're black, white, red, purple, yellow, whatever. So that is kind of the common ground that we all have. And I've been blessed to have therapists and doctors, nurses, specialists, and other patients who don't look like me, but they kind of get it, you know, so I can see the other side of the fence as well. There are people like Fadia said that aren't from our community that can get it if they want to put in the work to get it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, wow. I'll let somebody else talk now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, I, I was just in agreeing with uh, uh, with what you've both said. Um, it is different what we how we process our lives. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Even every morning that I have to take my medication, I'm like, oh, here we go again. Right? <laughs> I, 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 and I, I'm not. I'm going to be completely transparent. I hate that part. I hate yes, it. Yes. Yes. Um, sometimes it makes me gag. Sometimes it makes mm -hmm. me feel sometimes I'm dizzy sometimes right A every day you're never sure how the medication is going to land with mm -hmm. you um but you've made that commitment and it does take a toll on your mental health yes. and will my partner will my husband understand that mm, mm -hmm. not too sure because yes. if he has back pain he can just stretch right he can just he can just take a walk or take a hop yes. back and then he's okay the next day. What I have is I have this lifelong mm -hmm. journey um, process that I, I have to, that I'm reminded of every day um, that, you know, seven years ago, 10 years ago, I could have just, who knows, right? And just like you said earlier, um, Charles, you know, when you're, when you're a teenager, um, you're, you're 10 feet tall and bulletproof. I thought I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. So when they tell you, oh, you have, um, you know, um, chronic kidney disease, it's like, what, what are you telling me? Exactly. Right? This doesn't even make sense. Yeah. Nothing makes sense. Nothing makes sense. So uh, just today, I, you know, I have a coworker who said, you know, thank you for sharing your story. You don't look like what you've been mm -hmm. through. Yes. And I get an amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. amen. That amen. is a big the part thing of is it. Like, how, do we, how are we supposed to look? Yes. Well, yes. Right? Exactly. Yes. It's also that. 
but that is a mental part that we deal with every day as well. You don't look like anything's wrong with you. You know, we're supposed yeah. to continuously like, look sick. That's I what I think so. Exactly. We're supposed yeah. to always look sick. Yeah, and I just got up off my deathbed. You know, <laughs> I went right. out a couple weekends back. Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. No, it's so hard. I went out a couple weekends back. It was a barbecue and everybody was, oh, hi, Janine, how are you? And like, I had my transplant five years ago, okay? But the look on their face, it was like, I just literally had the transplant on Saturday and I'm in this party on Sunday. How are you? Are you, yeah. you want to sit down here? Here, have a seat. And I'm like, no, I'm good. I can stand. <laughs> I'm good, thank you. You know what I mean? Like, that's a continuous thing. Continuous yes. thing. I'm like, no, yeah. I'm good. I'm good. You know, and as opposed, and, and what you were saying, Charles, about being bulletproof, I was in, in denial, you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yep. You were in denial at such a young age. I was in my 20s, mid to That's... late 20s, and I was still in denial. So I can only <laughs> imagine. <laughs> yeah. Right? I can only imagine yeah. you. I was in denial, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. Not, nothing's going to happen to me. That's right. And exactly. Until going, it did. Yeah. Right? <laughs> you know, I kept going out. I was just doing what I normally did. You know, I was cute, looking good, hitting up the clubs, and you know, I was good until yeah. I wasn't. Right. That's right. So, that's right. One hundred percent understand where you're coming from, Charles. All right. One hundred percent. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Fadi. I don't even know if you know if you remember where you left off. <laughs> it's 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 all it's the same thing, and it's and it's funny to me because again, I think Ulysses said that earlier, right? We've we all have uh we all we have a common ground, which is yeah. transplant, right? Mm -hmm. But we we all lived it differently right yes. there's so many connectors the whole idea you know like I was definitely well in my 20s as well when yes. I found out but the feeling of first of all it's not me they got the wrong mm -hmm. person yep yeah and absolutely it's like yeah. okay it is me but I can beat this mm -hmm. can, especially the disease that I have right like I I can I can fight this thing if I do x y and z right like my my aunt came over from florida my lord god bless her she came over <laughs> and prayed over me prayed yes, some home prayed. remedies yes right, right? yes and it's like, okay yeah like you know i i'm a i'm a, I'm a believer and you know like i i understand how that side works but also auntie there's you know there's other, <laughs> there's other things that are mm -hmm. happening exactly there's some science right. too yep exactly. yeah. there's it's behind it and and so so there, it, it's there's so many, there's so many things we're all living through. It's like, we're all living this life, uh, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's the same and it's different at the same time. Yes. 100% <laughs> agree. 100%. Charles, what is your takeaway for our guests today regarding mental health? Well, for one, um, the first thing I think we all felt when we found out and came to grips with our situation is that I'm different. Number two, you're alone because you think you're the only person this ever happened to, you know, and that's not true. And then three, you know, find somebody to talk to. Like I said, you guys are my group. You know, you helped me along. And I want people to know that, you know, just from our conversation today, that mm -hmm. you're not alone, you know, um, and none of us made it on our own. We made it with help from someone and seek that help. You know, it doesn't mean that you're weak. It just means that you're human. We're all exactly. human. We're all trying to figure this out the best way that we can, because one thing they don't give us is an instruction manual on how to deal very with true. this. So, very you know. true. Fadia, first of all, before I let you speak, thank you very much for your friend who said, you know what? I know someone, bless mm -hmm. her, because, you know, it made a difference in your life. And that's amazing. You, saw, you looked out, you know, went out for yourself and you took care of yourself. So thank you to your friend. Yeah. I have to say that. Yeah. What's your uh, takeaway for our guests, um, for our audience? My my takeaway would be uh, kind of to piggyback on something that I mentioned earlier, um, the faith part, right? We, mm -hmm. a body of faith, we we often trivialize mental health, and mm -hmm. I I I would like to encourage us to um, still practice our faith, but also to to seek um, professional help. Yes. Uh, I think having the two together uh, makes will, will give you the best outcome, right? Someone who understands your faith mm -hmm. or someone who is faith based um, will will definitely help. But I I don't want to uh, people to kind of leave here and be like, 
oh, well, I'm not, I'm just going to dismiss my faith part, or I'm only going to take my faith. I think it's mm. both of them together that makes a powerful um, uh, combination uh, yes. for better health overall. Uh, but since we're talking about mental health, I think mm. that is very, very, very important because we, we tend to we tend to sometimes even romanticize our faith part. And if we just say certain things, um, it, everything will go away. Right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Unfortunately, um, it, it, well, in my experience, I have not seen it work like that. And with the people mm-hmm. that are around me, I have not seen it work like that neither. So having the two together, I would say is the best combination. Good combination. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Last, but definitely not least, not last but definitely not least okay. <laughs> you least <laughs> what would your takeaway be for our audience today um i got two things um the first thing is like one day at a time mm. uh and it's that's the simplest way i can put it one day at a time and um the second piece i was going to pick it back on what friday i said we go see somebody for our physical health. We go see somebody for, uh, you know, our spiritual health. Mm-hmm. So when you go see a doctor, like, you know, the doctors send you to a cardiologist, they send you to a physiotherapist, whatever. Like there's, there's different specialty inside of one body. So mm-hmm. similar to that, for your mental health, you go to see somebody for that. The same way you go see, like, let's say a pastor or a man or whoever for mm-hmm. your spiritual health. So you need you need all of it. So you need all of it to be able to to give the body what it needs. Mm-hmm. So that's uh, what I would. And that actually is perfect because it leads into uh, my nugget of knowledge for today. It's a quote from Michelle Obama. She said, we would never tell someone with a broken leg that they should just stop wallowing, get it together. We don't consider taking medication for an ear infection something to be ashamed of. We shouldn't treat mental health conditions any differently. So that is my nugget of knowledge for today. You guys, I appreciate you. I love that that you're here to share this conversation with me. And thank you very much for taking the time out to join me today and help educate our viewers, educate me. And, and let me laugh and, and dwell upon my, my childhood and reflect, damn, I'm doing the same thing to my child. I should probably think about that a little bit more often. And you guys are amazing. Yeah, you're my extended family and I'm glad you're here for me. Thank I'm you. glad you're here for thank me. You. Yeah, thank you for having us, Janine. Thank it's you. Awesome. Of course. So thank you for joining us today on the Green Table Talk. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.